today's video, we're gonna talk about the construction building process from start to finish, better known as the building life cycle. So let's go. Every construction project, both large and small, is different, so the process will vary. So for today, we're just gonna be talking about ground up construction, which simply means a new building being built on a plot of land. So the process actually starts out with an existing landowner, otherwise known as a seller, as well as a buyer, who can either be individuals or corporations. The existing landowner and the buyer settle on a price, including conditions of the sale. As part of the sale, a title company is typically engaged in which the title company provides information summarizing prior ownership and ensures that there are no liens on the land itself. The title company simply verifies that the existing owner or seller has the legal right to actually sell the property. In most scenarios, the buyer should also complete an ALTA survey. ALTA stands for American Land Title Association, and a licensed surveying company is hired to provide the following in this ALTA survey. Number one, records research, which is when the surveying company digs through county or municipal public and potentially some other private records to determine all known property lines, any relevant existing easements, existing public or private documented utilities that pass through the property, and much more. Number two, the fieldwork aspect, which includes an individual from that licensed surveying company going to the actual site and capturing size, location, and types of adjacent monuments, including waterways, pathways, other structures, which may not have appeared in the record as built documents from their initial record search. Number three, a plat or a map, which is the generated document from the surveying company showing all this information including the parcel number. You can look up Alta surveys online as there's a couple more items included in those at a bare minimum, but these are the main three. I'll post a link in the description below if you're interested in reading more about this. And again, this is all completed so that there are no surprises found prior to the transfer of the deed, which is the document stating the ownership of land. Okay, so the land buyer now becomes the new land owner, and the term owner is now used throughout the remainder of the construction process, more importantly because the term owner is standard contract language that will be referenced in future contracts. Prior to or during the purchase of this land, an owner will typically engage an architect. This can be an architectural firm who solely produces the construction documents or a design build firm who both produces the construction documents and facilitates the actual construction. There are tons of different ways an owner could approach this and how the construction process will be handled, and this is really up to the owner themselves. These are actually considered project delivery methods, and there's a handful of them. So for this example, the owner has approached the architect and entered into a contract directly. The architect Architect services not only include design, but they're also responsible to help facilitate, answer questions, and back check the contractor throughout the remainder of the construction process as a means of checks and balances to help the owner navigate through the construction process. The architect also typically has a few phases of design iterations where they narrow down exactly what the owner is expecting in their completed vision. The architect produces a schematic design drawing set, which is usually around 50 to 75% of what will become the complete construction documents. From there, they move on to the design development phase, which is about 75 to 90% of the completed construction documents. And finally, they move on to the construction contract documents or the bid documents, which should be the 100% completed construction documents that actually go out to bid to the general contractors, construction managers, and ultimately subcontractors. This should include a specification set as well. Also, after the sale of the land, but before design is finalized, the owner should have engaged a geotechnical engineering company. The purpose of these companies is to provide information on suitability of the subgrade soils to ensure that their future building isn't going to be built on subpar land and there is no risk at the building failing or sinking at any point in time. This is completed by taking soil borings, reviewing applicable water tables, and processing this information through a lab. This generates a geotechnical report which influences building structural design to ensure the weight of the building is going to be supported adequately throughout the building's life cycle as it relates to proper footing and foundation systems. When the architect has completed all these documents and compiled them together, the owner will engage a contractor, general contractor, or construction manager depending on the type of requirements of this project. This is considered the bid phase of construction. The GC or CM will likely not complete every aspect of scope on a larger project, so in turn they will solicit subcontractors for bids to ensure all aspects of the project and scope is covered in what will become their proposal to the owner. The CM or GC will solicit multiple bids from multiple subcontractors for different scopes, just as an owner may solicit 
multiple bids from multiple GCs or construction managers. This is all considered the pre-construction phase and resources such as estimators, schedulers, and project managers come together to compile these documents to help ensure that the project is ideally set up for success in this overall proposal back to the owner. So it's actually highly common for owners to interview GCs or CMs in person after they narrow down a list to ensure that they're engaging in qualified bidders and that the owner and the contractor's expectations align. So in the private sector, the low bidder does not necessarily always win. For instance, if someone's bid is 2 million while everyone else's bid hovers around 6 million, that's obviously a red flag to the owner that that company may have missed something during the pre-construction estimating phase. Also, how the proposal is presented, whether it shows backup numbers or it's just a lump sum, is also based on the owner's preference and owner's requirements on the front end, which goes back to the project delivery method and the contract structure to be. So ultimately, the contract between the general contractor or construction manager and the owner will have all sorts of contract language, but most importantly, it'll have a dollar value and a schedule tied to it. So the owner has awarded a project to a general contractor or construction manager, at which point the owner and this other party enter a new contract together for the construction project. The construction manager or general contractor then write additional contracts to their subcontractors who provided proposals throughout the process for the scope that they will not complete. Hey, just quickly, if you're new to the channel and you're really enjoying content like this, I would kindly ask you click that subscribe button below as it really helps this channel grow, especially if you want to see me produce more content like this in the future. These videos are actually all suggestions from viewers just like you, so don't be afraid to drop a comment below as I read all of them and go through them and actually include all the suggestions in future videos that I'll produce. Okay, as this pre-construction process is continuing, but prior to any actual construction, the architect has actually submitted these construction drawing sets to the city, county, or state and has been working with them towards a final permit release. The city, county, and state review these documents and release permits to the contractor. The contractor has to pay for these permits, pick them up, and typically post them on the job site in a visible area. Permit requirements vary drastically from project to project, including the front-end documents that are required to pull these permits. This all depends on the project type. The permit fees are typically to cover the review time that was needed from the city, county, or state, and furthermore, site visits from future inspections that will take place on the actual job site. Each permit will outline when a contractor should call for an inspection. Typical inspections for ground up construction include footing and foundation inspections, under slab electrical plumbing inspections, framing inspections, in wall inspections, above ceiling inspections, final inspections from your plumbing, electrical, and mechanical contractors, as well as final inspections for just the building and safety in general. This all leads up to the occupancy permit, which states that the building can be opened and is safe for the public. Again, inspections vary from project to project, so talk to the individuals issuing these permits for any clarity on this process. All right, we're leaving the pre-construction phase now that all the contracts are in place and we're entering into the construction phase. Okay, so in commercial construction, projects typically start out with what's called a submittal phase. A submittal in construction can be a variety of documents, but most notably, these documents are product data, samples, and shop drawings, which are submitted from the contractors to the architect and design team. These are not contract documents in themselves, but they're actually a means for the architect to back check the contract to ensure that the owner's building is going to match what's included in the construction drawings and specifications. The specifications actually define this submittal process along with all the other processes related to that project and no activity should really take place on site until all submittals applicable to that activity have been approved. So submittals range across all divisions of scope and they're also tied to material release. Material lead times can change drastically in the construction industry so getting this submittal process completed on the front end is critical to getting material release released and scheduled for an on-time site delivery. Okay, so continuing on with the actual construction phase, this is where things are really gonna vary from project to project. Contractors are allowed to perform their scope under what's called means and methods. As long as the contractor follows the construction documents, other aspects of the project are at the discretion of how the builder actually wants to complete the build. Essentially, these are techniques and procedures used to accomplish the end goal at the determination of the contractor. So sometimes there's an existing building that needs to get demoed before construction can actually start and sometimes it's just a vacant lot of land. So one of the first steps on majority of ground up construction projects is actually mass grading the land which just means cuts or removal or fills adding soils to ensure that the land meets the new topography of the contract documents. This information could be found in your civil set of the construction drawings. If the geotechnical report showed organic or poor soils the subcontractor responsible for the earthwork should be addressing this as they go to meet the standards of the specifications. While earthwork is taking place, you could also have a contractor installing your underground civil utilities. Again, these can be found on your civil drawing set, and these would 
include your water lines, your sanitary lines, and your storm lines. So next you're going to have some excavations at your building perimeter to form and pour your footings. These systems will have rebar incorporated as part of the design. Concrete is great for compressive strength while rebar is added for tensile strength. After that you're going to form and pour your foundation walls with more rebar. So all of this information can actually be found on your structural drawings. When pouring your foundations you actually place embeds and anchor bolts as you go. An embed is essentially a piece of metal that another piece of metal can be welded to to continue the support of your structure. An anchor bolt is similar as they're both means to connect the foundation system to the rest of the structure. Okay so after you form but before you pour both the footings and the foundation walls you'll have to call for an inspection as part of the permitting process. So your foundation walls will also have penetrations in them to allow for those water, storm, sanitary, electrical, and potentially any other lines to enter and exit the building. Some state codes actually have frost lines which are depths established below grade from historical freeze thaw information to prevent the footings, foundations, and other pipes shifting during cold winters. Now I'm definitely skipping over a few items and simplifying some things such as insulation, potential waterproofing, internet fiber lines, gas lines, but again this is just supposed to be a high level understanding of the construction process. After your foundations are poured, your civil and earthworking contractor should for the most part be done with majority of their scope. At some point your electrician and all those other trades responsible for running underground pipes throughout the site, such as other conduits and cables, need access to the site to complete their scope. A superintendent is present to juggle these site activities, but the sequence should just match that of the overall schedule established at the beginning of the job. So we've got our foundations poured, we have all the civil pipes and other site piping coming from the site to the inside of the building. We're going to transition now from looking at the civil set of drawings to the architectural, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing drawings. We're now going to coordinate the building itself as we build up from the ground. So your electricians and your plumbers will take over on the inside of the building pad before you actually pour any sort of slab. They have to run all the piping to where it needs to be because after you pour the concrete, there's really no shifting of any of these pipes. They have to get the inspections before you actually pour the slab to ensure that everything is in place, again, to meet applicable code. So after you pour the footings foundations, you've got your under slab plumbing electrical in place, you can pour your actual slab. From there, you're just continuing to focus on the structural drawings and the structural elements of the building. So this part of the project may incorporate elements of structural steel or just may transition right into framing, whether that's wood framing or cold form metal framing. If you have elements of structural framing, such as cold form metal framing, this could be found on the structural drawings, but more than likely, you're going to actually find these in the architectural drawings. Okay, so you've got to get another inspection after you complete the framing portion, and then your MEP contractors are going to continue to run their conduits and pipes in the walls according to the project requirements. Mechanical may include locations of thermostats, electrical may include light switches, power data, and plumbing may include any piping feeding sinks, toilets, drinking fountains, etc. Okay, so once everybody's completed everything inside the walls, you're going to call for an in-wall inspection, and then you're ready to close up these walls. So as you start closing up the walls with your drywall contractor, the MEP contractors are going to transition to the ceiling scope, where they would continue to run pipes and conduits overhead. They may have already started this process prior to closing up walls, but again, this is all dependent on the project and the schedule. Okay, so while everybody's kind of working on the inside, you should actually have wrapped up your roof and mostly enclosed the building to protect it from the elements before you start any finished conditions. What you don't want to happen is driving rain or elements from the outside impacting materials that you're putting in place and could potentially ruin them. Material products are not designed to withstand weather elements, so that's why you have to enclose the building as part of this next push. Okay, so the MEP contractors are continuing above ceiling, and anytime you close up a ceiling, you need to call for an inspection before you do so. All right, also, we didn't forget about the outside. The exterior activities are likely taking place, such as the curb and gutter, sidewalks, asphalt paving, irrigation, fencing, and landscaping as the building interiors progress. Okay, so back on the inside of the building, we're going to be working with our electrical contractor and our mechanical contractor to get some of the HVAC system started up. The reason we want to do this is because we want to climate control the building for temperature and humidity so when we're installing these products they don't warp or bend or twist in their final condition. Now this can also be achieved through temporary equipment on the job site. All right so now you can move into your finishes phase which includes painting, installing casework, hanging doors, installing hardware, installing flooring, and any other finished materials after the building's been acclimated. Your MEPs continue to wrap up their scope as their last inspection is considered a final inspection. Okay, so throughout the entire construction process, the subcontractors will actually build the GC and CM on a monthly basis, and the CM and GC will build the owner on a monthly basis. This just keeps a healthy workflow with cash
cash flowing through everybody's pockets. The architect and design team should also be making site visits to provide reports back to the owner as part of their contract to ensure that the work is meeting the construction drawings and specifications. Okay, so the last round of activities from the MEP contractors include startup and commissioning, which is a process to ensure all the equipment works and that the building is going to operate as intended. These requirements also include programming of automated systems, which can all be found in the specifications. So around this time in the end of the project, the MEP contractors are also going to call for their final inspections. After they get approvals, the GC or CM will call for a final building inspection. So the building inspector is going to do one final back check and one walk on site to ensure that the building meets the intent of all applicable codes and all safety requirements so that they can safely move on to the occupancy permit phase. This essentially allows private or public entities to enter the building after the construction phase. So after these final inspections, but prior to the city issuing an occupancy permit, the architect and design team have to provide a substantial completion letter and potentially some other documents or requirements to the city stating that they've also approved the status of the project. One of these items actually includes the punch list. The punch list is the last set of items the architect and design team mark as incomplete or non-conforming. This is the final back check to ensure the owner is going to get exactly what they paid for. All right, so the architect sends through the documents to the city and the construction team can finally request and submit for the occupancy permit. This may have been paid for in the initial permit fee, or you may have to pay for this individually at the end of the project. This end phase is now considered the project closeout. So yes, there are still requirements that the contractor owes and has to provide prior to being 100% complete and moving on from this project. These items include a closeout package, which includes owner manuals and maintenance data referred to as O&Ms. This typically includes owner training, which involves the CMGC subcontractors training an owner or an owner's facility team to operate the building. All of these closeout requirements are clearly detailed and listed out in these specifications. Okay, so final payments are made, and unless there's any warranty call, the facility team is really operating the building at this point, and the owner has taken over. This process goes on, and the building is operated until the owner decides to renovate or sell the building or piece of land. This process starts all over again at this point. So there you have it. That's essentially the building life cycle summed up at a high level. Okay, so I'm partially out of breath, but if you stayed around for this whole video, I appreciate you so much. This content takes a while to put together, so please share this information for anyone else in need. Also, it helps grow my channel and helps keep me motivated to keep making content like this for all of you. I really enjoy giving back and mentoring as I wish I had someone similar early in my career. And again, if you have any video suggestions, let me know in the comments section below and let's start chatting immediately. So as always, be better, build better, and bye, bye for now. now. Aww.